Okay, well, we're ready to go. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this very windy and rainy day in Sacramento. My name is Lindsay Robinson, and I'm the Executive Director of the California Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, we're honored and proud to have a very special guest in the office this morning, Chief Lori Ajax from the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Uh, we are going to walk through um, some of the final regulations and be taking questions um, from the live webinar feed. So none of you audio ability, but you can um, send in your questions whenever you want, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, the Bureau was kind enough to prepare a PowerPoint presentation for us this morning, so we're going to run through that, and then we'll get into question modes and hopefully run about 45 minutes. So um, if any of you joined us last year uh, when the emergency regulations came out, these webinars were incredibly helpful for our members, but then they also uh, were open to the public. Uh, after a couple of weeks to help educate um, all sorts of folks in the cannabis industry. But we're especially grateful to our members who are joining us today. Uh, your support of the organization makes our work possible. Um, so thank you to all of you. And I say we kick it off. Okay, take it away, Chief. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you again for having us. And uh, I'm going to go through, I'm going to go, I'm not going to read everything on these PowerPoint slides because we're going to, uh, CCIA is going to have this uh, PowerPoint presentation available on their website and we'll certainly have it on our website. Uh, really what I'm going to go through today is really some of the key changes uh, that became effective January 16th. Some of the, some things that got changed, some things that got added even towards the end. And so uh, we're just going to start with the simple stuff and uh, <laughs> The less controversial stuff uh, <laughs> is the definition. So if you know, all I well, all we did was listed the new definitions, uh, the definitions that we removed, um, and then what definitions changed. So I think uh, we just want to provide a list. So just in case uh, you didn't know that we had those things, that's something that you could take a look at the regs if you're unsure. But it's just giving you that list of what's been changed, what's new, and what's removed. Uh, Provisional licenses, um, you know, I know that's going to be a topic later um, on provisional licenses and, and just really just wanted to let you, everybody know, um, as most of you know, we had a tremendous amount of applications for temporary licenses towards the end of last year. Um, we issued a lot of temporaries in the month of December. I think uh, we were with like over 1,800 licenses were issued. And so uh, part of, I think, what of that was a lot of people wanted to make sure they could qualify for a provisional because in statute, you either had to have held or you have to have a temporary. Um, and the other requirement is having a completed application. Uh, anytime we, whenever we start, and we haven't issued a provisional yet, but we will be uh, very soon. Uh, those are valid for right now for 12 months. And although CEQA completion is not required, it does have to be underway. And um, so I'm gonna, I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about where we are in our provisionals, but right now I'm just gonna keep going through the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, one thing to notice, and, and I'm sure most of you noticed that our licensee fees changed. Uh, we changed how to calculate them to the uh, estimated gross revenue of your business. Uh, before we were doing it on the California Department of Tax and Fee uh, markup. And um, I think it was very difficult to, uh, for not just for you folks, I think it was all the questions coming in. We were having a hard time answering the questions to assist you with figuring out that markup. So at that point, uh, we knew that we had to change it because it shouldn't be that hard to figure out your licensing fees. So, uh, so we changed that, and then uh, we we had got a, a a lot of people talk to us about the tiers that there weren't enough tiers. So when you went from, uh, you know, from each tier, there was such a big jump in fee, and it really almost discouraged people from disclosing that where they were making more because of that big jump. So in most of our uh, fees, we expanded from five tiers to nine tiers, and really it was supposed to make sure that it wasn't just such a, a big jump in fees if you were, you know, scaled your business or whatnot. And then the other thing you may have noticed is that we removed the distributor transport only. That's just under the distributor fee. Uh, business modifications, we, we 
you know, we tried to make this a little easier. We, we've now developed a form where you can, there, there are a lot of notifications and things that you have to notify us on. And so we tried to incorporate that into one form. So you could just pull up that one form and provide us those notifications. Now it's a rather long form. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we went back and forth. Should we break this up and have separate forms? Um, you know, we, you know, down the future, if that's going to be easier, we can do that. But right now, we just thought it was easier just so you had everything on one form. So there was some notification time change. I think the biggest thing that we heard from people is the change in ownership. And uh, we didn't have really a path for if you're going to change ownership for to continue operating while that ownership change occurs. So what we, I, what, I think what really helped is us changing that. So as long as one existing owner remains, that license can continue to operate. So you're not having a break in business just because somebody, if you have new partners coming in. And the other thing is, and, 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 and I'm gonna say right here, a lot of these changes you're seeing as a direct result of, of all of you folks telling us, uh, asking your questions. Uh, you know, we get a lot of questions on the BCC email and you probably go, gosh, why do we have to always email the Bureau? But it's so helpful because we, once we see those questions, we start to see patterns of people asking questions. And one thing that came up was if, if a license gets terminated for, they go out of business or maybe they're gonna, you know, go in with somebody else and they're leaving that location, what happens to the cannabis goods? And prior to these final regulations, we really didn't have a, a means for people to unload their inventory. So now we've come up with a process that, you know, will allow you upon approval by us to have a distributor, if you're a retailer, have a distributor or a micro business be able to purchase that. So I think that's helpful and also allow that those cannabis goods, as long as they have the current uh, certificate of analysis to not have to be retested. Uh, and, and then we had some, we, we changed some advertising. Uh, pr you know, obviously uh, before this, we had, we had prohibited using any depictions or images of anyone under 18. And there was a lot of folks that pointed out to us, well, why 18, why not 21? And so we changed that to make sure that you're not using any depictions or images, you're not using anything that's attractive to people under 21. Um, probably some of the bigger advertising thing is the advertising, we were prohibiting advertising free cannabis goods, giveaways, so you can't do buy one, get one free, uh, no sweepstakes, mm -hmm. raffles, or contests. And then the outdoor signs, Though we haven't heard a lot from this because I think people were looking at other things in our regs, uh, but we did change um, on advertising on billboards. Uh, the, the statute uh, didn't really give, didn't really clarify, did that mean, you know, because it was sort of broad on you can't advertise on any interstate highway or state highway that crosses the border. So that was pretty, uh, that, that could mean even in the middle of Fresno, yeah, you know, so we tackled this thinking, well, I don't, you know, what was the, the intent of that? And so we, we looked at the, the statute and we felt that, you know, I don't know that, you know, in the middle of some of these cities uh, prohibiting billboards, what, what really was what the intention. So we looked at it and we made the decision that, you know, a 15 mile radius. So any, so you can't advertise in that 15 mile radius right when that that state highway or any state highway crosses the California border. Um, and so hopefully um, uh, that, that, that I think gives everybody a little bit more guidance on where they can advertise when it comes to billboards because we just really didn't have that before. Mm -hmm. um, this one has become a, a, a big one for us. Uh, we have prohibited licensees from selling or transporting any kind of gear goods that are labeled as beer, wine, uh, liquor, spirits, or anything that's going to mislead uh, the public that this product is an alcoholic beverage. And we uh, continue to see a lot of products coming through uh, that still have this. So uh, we have been, you know, uh, uh, you know, when we see those things come through after the certificate of analysis, uh, we get pictures of the product. Uh, we have been uh, telling some of our licensees that if they have things like 
you know, it's a cannabis wine or a cannabis lager beer. Uh, we are having them change those uh, to not have those types of labels. Branded merchandise. So we now have a process for approving branded merchandise. So we've been getting um, a lot of folks that have been sending us email on the BCC email wanting approval for branded merchandise. Uh, just want to make clear when you look at, I think it's 5000 B, there's a whole list of things that we identify that that they can sell as branded merchandise. And I want their clothing, hats, pencils, pens, it's a whole list of things. If your merchandise that you're branding falls under anything in 5000 B, you know, it falls under the clothing, hats, pencils, you do not have to get approval from the Bureau. It's only other things that aren't included. So I just, I, I know a lot of folks are already sending us like, for example, you know, t-shirts and saying, is this okay? If it says that you can do branded merchandise on clothing, then you can do that. Again, you have to be careful that it's not, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, attractive to children and things of that nature. Um, it's only the other things that aren't on this list that you have to email us with a picture to get approval. Uh, we did change um, uh, inventory requirements. Uh, I think uh, if you guys remember, we had every 14 days you had to do an inventory uh, uh, it was required to do inventory and we had a lot of folks come to us and say do you have any idea how long that takes to do this like we have to close down our store we have to do it overnight and like again that was one of those things where I don't think we realized that requirement how how much that impact your businesses so we decided well do we really need that and we decided hey it really is your responsibility to know what's in your inventory at really at all times. So instead of us dictating that you have to do it every 14 days, we're just basically saying, hey, you have to do your, you should have know your inventory and it's already going to be tracked and track and trace also. And that's a requirement. So we got rid of that. Um, also, we heard from folks that you wanted some more options when it came to being able to have to accept shipments um, that in some cases our regs didn't address situations where products were damaged or they weren't compliant. So we, we, we extended uh, uh, when you can reject shipments. Um, and then again, we have, if you terminate your license, we have a process for, you know, you know, getting rid of those cannabis goods by either if, if you have to destroy it, but you can now have somebody purchase them if approved by the Bureau. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to go really quickly over these because again, you're going to have this PowerPoint, but I just want to remind distributors that, you know, you can only distribute cannabis goods, cannabis accessories as defined in the health and safety code and the branded merchandise or promotional materials. Um, I think one of the other things that we've heard a lot from is that we've also required that when you, as a distributor, when you provide storage services, they have, it has to be packaged as sold at retail. That does not include live plants. And we've heard from a lot of folks because I'm, I'm thinking uh, this isn't probably working for some business models. And so I, I do think that is something we've got to take a look at. Uh, just to be clear, though, if you're going to be the distributor that is going to arrange, like, for example, you get a big batch of flour and you're going to arrange for testing and you're going to do the packaging, you could store that bulk flour while it's getting through testing because you're the distributor that's also going to do the packaging. And, of course, we did uh, change that uh, tested cannabis goods for retail sale can be transferred to one or more distributors. They have to have a COA attached and that COA is good for 12 months. And I think that's really helping the supply chain. Um, so hopefully that's working. Uh, distributors, you still have all the quality assurance review, review confirming the COA is not older than 12 months. Um, you can now you know, label uh, cannabis goods for cannabinoid contents and uh, things of that nature. And you have to make sure that 
when before they go to retail sale, they haven't exceeded their expiration date and meets all the packaging requirements. So, so most of that has stayed relatively the same with the exception of being able to label. Uh, remediation, and I'm not going to go through all this. The only really change here is, is that if you're a micro business and uh, you have a product and you're doing either cultivation or manufacture and you have a product that needs remediation, the micro business remediation plans go to the Bureau and not the Department of Public Health uh, because we will be approving those remediation plans for the micro businesses. Retailers, just a few sections were added. We added some requirements to let folks know what's required when the business is not open. There seemed to be some confusion. I think they're pretty straightforward. Make sure your, your premise is secured, locked, you have an active alarm system, and there's only access during, uh, there's only access during these non-business hours for employees or authorized individual. Uh, we are allowing now retailers that are the, of the same ownership, they can transfer cannabis goods from one retail to the next as long as they're owned by the same licensee. And then I think a big change was the cannabis goods, the child resistant packaging requirements. Sometimes it gets a little confusing. <laughs> so I tried, we tried to really break it down with these slides. So until January 1st, 2020, <laughs> All cannabis goods have to be in child resistant packaging, but that can be met right now until January 1st, 2020 by the exit package at retail. Now after January 1st, 2020, all cannabis goods still needs to be in child resistant packaging, but this requirement it can't be met with exit packaging. Does that make sense? Does that say, yeah, okay. <laughs> Try to break it we'll down. We'll probably get that question again <laughs> so you'll have another opportunity. <laughs> um, one of the other things we managed to, to get in at right, right during our, when we did after our 45 day comment was we decided we needed to define what it means to have a technology platform. Well, really for most of, mostly it was designed for delivery, right? So we, we knew that there was a lot of these technology platforms that helped uh, licensees with delivery. And so we thought it was important to really define that. And really, I think that's helping our licensee so they know mm -hmm. when they hire someone to assist them with this, um, they know that that technology platform, they can't make the delivery, they can't share in the prof profits. <clears throat> and one of the things I think is really important is, is when your customers are going to that website, I think it's important they know that who they're buying their products from, that they're buying it from you, that you're uh, the retail you know, location they're buying it from. Uh, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to read everything here, but just we, we just made it more clear that, you know, obviously we have a sentence in our reg that has caused a lot of, uh, a lot, lot of talk. Um, we do allow, when you have a retail license, you're allowed to deliver in any jurisdiction jurisdiction in California. We just did a clarification uh, to our final regs, just making sure people understand that is prohibiting schools, daycare centers, or youth centers, so there's no confusion um, of that. Uh, and then just some of the, the delivery requirements, that did change from the emergency regs. Um, you know, we do require GPS for our delivery vehicles, and they have to provide a history of everywhere they went. Um, they also have to follow the same rules as our, our distributors when it comes to transporting. They have to have it in an enclosed box, container, or cage. And then we did change uh, how much can be carried during delivery. This one always gets hard to say. So you can have up to $5,000 in a delivery vehicle of retail value, um, but no more than $3,000 of that is like things that hasn't been ordered uh, prior to leaving the premises. It's just really hard to write that down. Yeah, so that, um, that's it. that is confusing. It's right very now. confusing. Yeah, we'll probably so, get more questions on that. So we, we, we try to get better at breaking this <laughs> down, but um, happy to, to, to answer any further questions on that later. Um, the only really change to the micro business is that we are we do allow um, the type and manufacturing licenses that qualifies as one of the activities for the micro business, and that was really the change there. Um, 
testing laboratories, uh, probably the big one is the limits for ethanol does not apply to cannabis products that contain alcohol and intended to be orally consumed. Um, there are a list of other things that we did change in the testing laboratories, not really huge changes, uh, just to be more consistent, especially when it comes to transportation, to be consistent with uh, the other license types on transportation of cannabis goods. Uh, cannabis events, as most of you know, that was probably uh, one of the biggest change. Uh, so now they can be held anywhere where the local jurisdiction has expressly approved. Um, everybody asks me what expressly approved mean. It virtually means the jurisdiction has said yes. I mean, that's really all we need is they have to say yes to us. <laughs> uh, and then we added the informational ed and educational events. I, I think there was a lot of confusion. If there's no sales and there's no consumptions, uh, you don't need a temporary cannabis event uh, by the Bureau. And then I saved the best for last, 5032. I thought you'd love that. You know, just so you know, I had staff help me with this. They put it at the beginning. Yeah, and I you're said, like, no, no, let's no, not no, do it at no, the beginning. No. Let's do it at the end. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, that was, you know, obviously we got a lot of comments on this. Um, basically, what we're saying in 5032 is that any commercial cannabis activity has to be conducted between licensees. And we sort of broke it down in the second bullet point here. Licensees may not conduct commercial cannabis activities on behalf of an unlicensed person, but a person that's already disclosed as an owner or a financial interest is not unlicensed. And I think there's where the confusion is. Um, and so um, I'm happy to answer any more questions on that. I did put in a slide because I thought it might be helpful. What is a financial uh, interest? And, you know, if there is an agreement, what we consider agreements to receive a portion of the prop profits. I'm not going to go through everything. You're going to have this for everybody on the website. Yep. Um, okay, so now that we um, have gone through that PowerPoint, um, I'm sure that folks have a lot of questions. And um, as Chief Ajak noted, noted, we will have um, the PowerPoint available on our website to CCI members and then to the broader audience um, or the broader industry uh, within uh, a couple weeks. So we hope that's really useful for everyone. We have a really awesome list of attendees today. Thank you everyone for uh, for chiming in. So um, we have, CCI came up with a couple quick questions that we want to ask um, as well. So mm -hmm. the journey from emergency regulations to permanent regulations demanded um, constant reciprocal education between the licensing authorities and the industry. What methods of advocacy or education from cannabis operators have helped you better understand the issues unique to the industry? And I know you've kind of touched on some of them, but yeah. if there are other ways that we can encourage folks to be involved or give feedback, that this would be a great time to check out some of that. Well, I think CCIA themselves, you know, the, all the associations have been really helpful in really because you guys are hearing sometimes even more than we are from different parts of the industry. So that has been really helpful to have the ongoing dialogue that we have with you. I mean, you guys are very good about telling us what's coming up on the horizon. I, I think I'm always worried about the things I don't know, right? That everybody thinks we know. The Bureau must know about that. But just knowing what's concerning the industry whether, you know, even things like phase three testing, knowing like there's a big concern and how can we alleviate that or minimize those concerns. And so really, I, I really love that we have such a strong working relationship, but I can't emphasize enough like your comments to us, whether it's on social media, whether it's through the emails, we are constantly looking at those and saying, oh, okay, we didn't think of that. Or, yeah, you're right, the regs are unclear on that. And I can't tell you enough how helpful that is. So co constantly engaging us. You have to continue to do it. You know, even if it, it persistence pays off, believe it, because sometimes we do get really busy. But at the same time, it's important we hear from everybody. Great. Well, thank you. So that that's helpful. Keep keep your questions, comments coming. I think one of the big um, areas that folks would love to know about is, is there going to be any um, additional changes made to the final regulations that we're now living under um, at any point in 2019? And if so, do you foresee there being, again, another open comment period? Can you kind of walk us through what, yes. what, you, what you expect on that? 
Yes. Uh, so, you know, boy, I was—I didn't think I'd be saying this right now, but yes. Oh, the finals are not final. <laughs> yeah, the finals are not right. final. I wasn't willing to say that on the 16th, but I'm there now, right? Okay, good. You did. You got a little over a month. I've got a little over a month. <laughs> uh, no, I—I I think we—we we, and, and, and we are. I am kidding. We knew that these wouldn't be final. Um, they were final in the sense mm. that we had to get. We had to go through the full rulemaking. You know, we knew our emergency regs were only good uh, to a certain point, and we had to get the final regs out. So sometimes when we use the word final, it's probably not the right word. But mm -hmm. so right now we are looking at things. So a CCIA has brought up some stuff to us, uh, the Distributors Association. We've been hearing from other associations. We're seeing on our emails some things that we're like, oh, okay, that's probably not what we meant. So there's two ways we're handling this. One right now, we're working on getting fact sheets out. We, we got the testing lab fact sheets because there was some confusion on the variance, the 10% variance. And so uh, we're, we're, we're very close to having a, a retailer fact sheets out um, for every single license type. And yes, I've been promising guidance on 5032 and that's coming too mm -hmm. um so first we've got to we we i think we got to make sure people understand uh and we do what we can through fact sheet and guidance but where are there issues with the regs for from a business perspective that's really impacting business then i think we need to go up go in and for one thing there's going to be some cleanup we know we have some cleanup to do in some areas that we can clarify things better so I think you're going to see a package like that. We also are hearing from some of the local jurisdictions. There's a, all sorts of things that maybe don't really, that conflict with their ordinances or there are things that we can do better, and especially when it comes to new business models. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we're going to be looking at, is there additional license types we need to add to this structure? So yes, I, the answer is yes. We're going to. OK. And do you expect an open comment period yes. where you're going to hear from the industry? Yeah, because at this point, everything's going to go through the regular rulemaking yeah. okay. process. So there would be the comment Good period. To know. Good yes. to know. So we'll be anticipating that again. Thanks, Josh Drayton, for uh, spearheading most of CCIA's committees and, and bearing the brunt of, of that burden. Um, it is incredibly useful, though, to, to, for that feedback. And you know, as CCIA, we, we learn so much from our operators and the, the struggles yeah. that they, they go through. Yeah. Um, so a couple other questions. We have a whole bunch of questions that are coming in as well. So if we don't get to these on this webinar, um, please be assured that um, as you know, that we'll be passing all of these questions on to the Bureau and they um, will hopefully address them. We know that the um, you know, FAQs are going to be coming out on the regulations, which I think are going to be really helpful. We've had some questions about um, uh, 5417 and the, the storage, the cage requirements. Can yes. you just walk us through a little bit more about how those really practically um, come into play? Because I think there was some concern that it couldn't use any portion of the van as a barrier or um, as part of the cage. Yeah, that's probably one of the areas where we're looking at um, perhaps making some change to the regulation. Um, we were hoping maybe we could do it with guidance, but really the way we I think what the Bureau was trying to get at with that, because we got tons of questions prior to the final regs on what we meant by the cage and what would qualify. And I think really what we're looking at, is wherever there's an, uh, whether, whether it's the back door, the sliding door, the passenger door, wherever you were gaining entrance to that vehicle, that there was some secondary barrier there. And we probably could have written it a little better, but it you know those things happen you're you know I, i'm going to say those regs were pretty extensive and so sometimes mm -hmm. so i think we've heard from a lot of stakeholders that gosh the expense of trying to yeah. not being able to use the ceiling of a vehicle because you got to put some kind of cage and so i think those are some of those are and by the way i know i don't want you to think that every regulation package is going to take like a year because that's not the case yeah. when you have quick and simple cleanup stuff mm -hmm. we can get through it pretty quickly 
um, because you're not, it's not like we were last year where you're taking comments on everything, everything. in the regs. So yeah. those can handle, and I think we just got to probably more discussions with you of what, you know, because at the same time, we also want to ensure public safety here. So I think mm -hmm. we just, so that's a perfect example of some of the cleanup I think we're going to be looking at. Okay, great. Um, all right, so under um, section 5023, what is the requirement if an owner goes from 100% to only 5% of a financial interest holder? She's looking it up, folks. Yeah, I, you know, it's so I so in the interest of time, I'm going to say it is it, it's very hard to answer these types of uh, uh, questions like in a few minutes without really seeing the business structure. So, you know, those are something I'm I'm happy to take offline with any of you, um, and and I'll make the commitment right here. Whoever has a question, we're gonna have somebody. You give us your contact information, and we'll get you that answer right away. Because otherwise, I don't want to. The last thing I want to do is not understand your business structure and not give you good information because you want a, the right answer okay not good. a quick answer all right so that that one um we'll we'll head over there with the uh we'll send to the bcc with the the names attached um phone number email phone address. number yes yes and feel free to send those questions to us too um uh via email if you want we're going to be submitting all this stuff so um so who's the point of contact at the agency regarding annual licensing and applications and status and sort of the processing? And we are going to talk a little bit about that, but if you can share that information, that'll give people a contact. So everybody that has a temporary license that has submitted an annual license, they have a analyst that's assigned to their application. So that really is your first point of contact. Um, if, if something is happening and you feel like you're not, getting a good customer service and they have a manager and that person has a manager, but really you want to develop that relationship with that first point of contest with that analyst. And if you've submitted an annual, I, they, sh they probably have already contacted you through email stating what it is they need from you. If you're don't have an annual application in, this is a perfect time for me to say, please get your annual application yeah, today. in. Spend the because day. Because as soon as you get that in, you will be assigned an analyst. But in the meantime, uh, I, I can provide, uh, Lindsay, I can provide you with a contact to our licensing unit if you just absolutely you know, have a burning question that you need to ask about the annual application. We can provide you with a contact person. But really, we want to encourage, we're looking at about 1,800 temporary license holders who have not submitted an annual application. Wait, how many? 1,800. Folks, get them in. If you haven't yet, 1,800. Then okay, you get your analyst, and then yeah. you've got a person you can talk to and have answer your questions and all that. And I, I, so it's really, really important. We've already started uh, sending weekly emails to get you to get your annual application in, and we are starting to call people, too, because we, we, we want to get you Really, and, and, and remember that annual application is going to also is going to determine whether or not we can give you a provisional license. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's really important that we get it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so testing labs have been under the microscope um, from regulators and the industry, and we know that there's been um, some, some tension around some of that stuff. Um, can you talk a little bit how the BCC is working to standardize testing met methodologies? So right now, uh, we are concentrating, one, obviously making sure that our licensees are, we, we are doing what they need to do and following the regulations, especially when it comes to using their instrumentation and all of their methodology for handling a sample, whether they're homogenizing that sample, how they're reporting their testing results. And so part of what we've been doing is visiting every single lab uh, that we have issued a temporary license to. Uh, we had we did that in starting in late December. We finished up just at the end of January, going and visiting every lab, looking at their equipment. And our scientists are very good. They would go in there, look at their equipment, make sure. 
that they're using it properly, making sure, like I said, they're, they're handling the sample and reporting those results. Uh, we're going to continue doing that because I think it's really important that we make sure our labs that are testing this product are doing it consistently. Um, is there going to be a lot of work as we get more laboratories on board, as we get into the annual requirements? Uh, it is. It's going to take making sure we get their stamp, their you know their SOPs uh, correct, and it's also holding those lights, those laboratories responsible that aren't testing to. Uh, the regulatory standards, uh, because I don't think that helps anybody if we allow them to continue to operate. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, enforcement. Um, we've gotten a few questions online here, but um, can you give us the, the major priorities for the BCC right now in terms of enforcement? Yeah, so a majority, um, so we're looking you know, as we issue more licenses, we see the, our complaints really go up because as more people get licensed, they're seeing, well, wait a sec, what about this guy that's unlicensed? So uh, um, we've gotten over like 6,000 uh, complaints just in the last year, but we've seen a real rise just in the last few months. Uh, and I, I think we hover around 80% of that is still complaints on unlicensed activity. So of course that, I mean, that's the priority, unlicensed activity. Going from there, though, you've got so many complaints. We then even further define it, one of our enforcement priorities. I mean, obviously, public safety issues, if somebody's selling to a minor, if there's, you know, somebody's really creating a lot of problems, that public safety always comes first. But then next, it's really honing in on this unlicensed activity that's occurring uh, in the areas where there is cannabis regulation, where it's just a it's you know right you know right down the street from a licensed uh, retailer or where it's it's really obvious it's in direct competition with our uh, with our licensees and really working with that local jurisdiction and and also I mean we also have to look at are they in the process trying to get a license have they you know do are they trying to get a license I mean we're going to look at other factors but we really want to prioritize by really the folks that are really directly competing with you more so than, you know, you know, you know, those, you know, that are doing, you know, cannabis, uh, commercial cannabis activity in public lands or whatnot. We have other methods for that, working with the administration on who's best to handle that, but really focusing in on, on, on where it's really, I think, hurting you the most. Um, the other, and, and it's, and it, and it's really taking a more aggressive stance. I mean, it's fine. We, we did. We, it's, it's always good to do education. I'm never going to say we've got to educate people and make sure they understand how to apply for a license. I, I, I get that. And we'll always do that. But now we've got to take a more uh, aggressive stance, more of a zero tolerance. If you're not getting a license, if you have no intention of getting a license, if there's no problem with the locals and trying to get your application mm -hmm. through, then you're just not complying, so something has to be done. And uh, we are going to be starting our public awareness campaign. Okay. Uh, that's probably get, that's kicking off this next month. We finally got through our. We had gotten opposed mm -hmm. uh, by another contractor, and so that got settled. Uh, so we're hoping that'll meet that educational mm -hmm. component and making sure people understand if you're not licensed, uh, you're you're it's it's against the law, and there's going to be consequences. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, that was one of our questions, too, was to talk a little bit about the education campaign. Um, what can we look forward to? Well, uh, and, and most of you know uh, Alex Traverso. He's going to head up that public awareness campaign. And so uh, I think we have some really uh, uh, great ideas uh, for how we can really get this message and across of making sure we're directing consumers to retail premises that are licensed, uh, delivery retailers that are licensed, making sure people understand that if you're going to go to a retailer that's licensed and legal, you're going to get safe cannabis. Um, you can assure you're getting the product you've asked for. It's not some counterfeit product and whatnot. And I think uh, that and also making sure people understand it's against the law if you're conducting commercial cannabis activity, not to have a license. So we have some great ideas. I think you're going to see right out the gate, uh, we're going to come up with, uh, you're going to see us doing something. But if you have any ideas, you know, Alex, you know, he, he's around. <laughs> we work him. He's uh, really excited. He, he's happy to, yeah. to discuss them with you.
that's great. Uh, we're like, we're really looking forward to that. We do hear quite a bit um, from members and non-members and electeds about how crucial education is. So we're we're excited to um, to see what's what's coming for that, and then also to be a resource if we yes. can be in any way. Yes. Um, so, what sort of enforcement penalties are there for non-licensed advertising for non-licensees advertising cannabis? Um, I.e., uh, unlicensed brands, dispensaries, and technology platforms advertising for delivery services of non-licensees. Is is that a big issue? And, and how it are you is. tackling that? Yeah, it is. So we're seeing. So they're they're it, depending on on what the activity is they're doing. Um, it really there's a variety of things we have at hand. Um, there's civil penalties uh, that we can bring forward by the local DA or the attorney general's office, uh, especially for really egregious stuff, but that's just really over the top. Then we also have, the Bureau has citation authority to issue citations and fine them up to $5,000. Um, that is in our regulations. Uh, we are gonna, you're gonna start seeing us utilize that process. And then we also uh, refer our unlicensed uh, cases to the Division of Investigation to the Cannabis Enforcement Unit. That's the, the law enforcement sworn, uh, sworn law enforcement part of the Bureau. Um, and what, what they're doing right now is uh, they're also uh, prioritizing their cases, working with local law enforcement, serving search warrants, uh, you know, confiscating you know, all the illegal product, uh, going to their bank accounts, the money. Uh, so all of that is happening. Uh, we, if you're if you're on our list serve or you follow the bureau, we've had uh, several press releases coming out with different search warrants up and down the state that's been served. You know, putting these unlicensed folks out of business. You're going to continue to see a lot more of that this year, um, and because they're really like, I, and I always say this, we're, we we. It, it really helps to have the final regulations in place. It helps the collective cooperative model has expired, so that's no longer in place. And just, every, I think everybody this year knows what's expected, knows what the rules are, and I think you're just gonna see us getting uh, better at what we're doing and honing our enforcement skills and how we uh, tackle these cases. Yeah, that's great to hear. It is a major concern for a lot of our members who are that have worked so diligently and spent so much time and money to become compliant to have the illicit industry be still undermining, um, you know, their efforts to to succeed. So um, I'm glad that you're um, thinking a lot about that. And uh, okay, next question here: Do retailers need to hold physical copies of COAs? I think, you know, I think this question has been coming in, is it okay for, to, to have that email to them, and, and, and I'm guessing what they're getting at is can they just have a digital mm -hmm. uh, copy of the COA, and I, I, I believe we've said that's okay to do, um, that you don't have to have the physical copy as a retailer. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so we do want to... Um, move into a little bit about annual processing. So um, we've heard there's some delays. What are the biggest hurdles that you're seeing or the questions that you're hearing from folks on, on getting the annuals processed? Yeah, so I, I think what, uh, so we're, I, we're in good shape to get our, an, more, more, I think, we're more focused on probably getting provisional processed mm -hmm. for those that have temporary and then working on the annuals for the folks that don't have temporaries, if that if that makes sense. So those, that's our priority. One, making sure before temporaries expire, those that have a annual application in, we either get them in a provisional or annual, and then, but we also have to be focused too on the folks that weren't able to get a temporary, that we're still working through their annual. So uh, we have, um, we're looking at all, and, and again, we, we, we have to have your annual application in order to process it. So that, that's back a, to that one. <laughs> I'll go back to that one. Yep. Uh, but of the, we have about, uh, I think we're just over 1,200 uh, applications that we have. What we're doing right now is we're going through those applications and we're looking at what information has been provided to us. I think the biggest challenge we're seeing is 
not everybody has everything we need. And I think that's could be the reluctance for people applying for an annual application. It's so much information that it's like gathering all that and putting it all together and submitting it is, is quite a bit of work, right? So not everybody has their standard operating procedures uh, finished. So one of the things we're looking at, and it's funny, we just uh, ha I just had a meeting with our IT staff. I, I'm, I'm to the point where you, and you have to upload something other just to even co complete that annual application. So we're looking at maybe a way where you can submit us something by just saying, hey, it's in progress, but we haven't com completed that. What we're looking at, I'd like to get folks at least through the first part of the applications where you're answering the questions, you're, you're, you're answering the attestations, you're telling us how many employees you have and whether you have a seller's permit, sort of the easy stuff. Mm -hmm. And then getting that submitted to us so we can at least get you started on the background of getting your you know, DOJ fingerprints. We can start looking at some of the, at least the first line ownership. So we're kind of trying to come up with some ways and strategies that we can encourage more people, get them in and out of our licensing system quicker, and then gathering these documents down the road when you've had more time to work on them. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. I think, I think we've got to look to ourselves we can't just say, I mean, I, I'm going to tell you, get your annual application, but if it's really difficult to do that, we got to look back to ourselves and say, okay, how can we make this process easier? And maybe we don't, we don't need, every, maybe we don't need everything all at once. Maybe taking it in pieces works for both sides. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's helpful to know. Um, you know, I do, I, we're going to end this webinar in just a couple minutes because I actually have to go over and, um, and testify in the Capitol on um, SB 67. Uh, so that's a exciting, <laughs> but also a little bit of a crazy day here uh, filming in the in the studio. Um, so I think maybe we should wrap up here with just talking about, so obviously um, the biggest things that, that CCIA members have, have expressed to us are kind of threefold. The enforcement issues, taxes, which we're working um, statutorily on some of those, um, but then local access. So we know that a lot of communities are still um, not moving forward with ordinances. Um, how do um, our members or folks in the industry um, engage better on those issues? Um, and how does the BCC, um, if at all, if they can engage, I mean, you're, you're a state agency, so um, local control is a huge part of this conversation and was a real push um, when, you know, this, the, the regulations were coming into play. So what, what options do we have to move the needle on that? If, Sure. Yeah, I, I I do think we need to to have more engagement with the local jurisdiction. And 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 I'm going to tell you, as a state agency, it, it's not our job to convince the local jurisdiction one way or the other, but it is our job to give them to assist them with the questions they have. And I think what's probably what we want to make sure is the local jurisdictions that really don't. I mean, a lot of them don't have a lot of resources to do a lot of research in what our regs say, what the statutes say, how we're looking at things. And so, I mean, I look back at some of these folks, maybe we only have two or three people, if that, working on this. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at how can the Bureau be more of a resource for them? So they're getting good information. We can tell them things that are working, things that, that aren't working for us, and really a system in that. Um, and I think that's where we've got to have greater visibility, and that's we, we are establishing our local liaison unit. Uh, right. We're going to have uh, about 10 folks that all they're going to be doing is outreaching with the locals, giving them information, helping them. And I think if you have a jurisdiction that you think is struggling that could assist, that we could be of assistance, don't hesitate to tell us that, mm -hmm. because let's concentrate where we know um, that we can help and um, with like again when you're looking at over 500 jurisdictions sometimes it is good to have some targeted spots if we know yeah. like hey they're sort of struggling bureau can you assist them at least with explaining your regs and things of that nature yeah I think that would be extremely helpful and we know that a lot of these jurisdictions I think were kind of sitting and waiting for the final regulations to come out so they, right. they had a better sense of what they were working with and we also saw a ton 
of um, local tax initiatives pass in November, some of which were crazy high and probably will actually prohibit growth in their jurisdictions. But, um, you know, I think we did see some some positive movement. So we're hopeful um, that we can continue to be a part of that conversation and certainly any way that we can work with the Bureau on, on um, educating uh, local communities, I think is really important. So, um, all right, well, we are going to uh, wrap up there. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. In. My pleasure. Hey, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us today I, I'm really we always want to try to help whenever we can so don't hesitate to reach out to us and don't worry we're on it we're on your provisionals and your annuals okay yeah. excellent <laughs> wonderful all right well thanks everyone for joining us um, as you know we've got um, the department of food and ag uh, coming up at 11 15 Josh Drayton is going to be um, hopping in uh, to moderate that conversation um, with Richard Parrott and then uh, we have uh, the Department of Public Health um, talking with Christina Dempsey later on today. So we're um, excited to bring you these webinars. They'll be up on our website for those who miss them or if you want to refer and um, the, the presentation that um, Chief Ajak presented will be up on our website as well. So thanks so much for tuning in, folks. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.